morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you. And I want to wish you uh, the blessing of Advent. Randy, Pastor Randy, thank you and Hannah for that beautiful song. Amen. Thank you and the praise team. Steve, thank you for your prayer. Amen. Dietrich and Gerke families, thank you. You know, all of these things don't just set the table for worship. They're, they're all a part of the table and a part of the feast. And uh, I've been blessed already, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Can we bow our heads and just ask God's presence to, to illuminate our minds as we open Scripture together? Lord, we come to your word once again, believing in faith that the power of the Holy Spirit attends your word. Not my words, but your word. And I ask that your Holy Spirit will use my words to point all of us together, myself included, to your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you have traditions that you think about when you think about Christmas? <laughs> traditions that... Uh, that call to mind memories of Christmas's past. I um, grew up in a pastor's family. And uh, there was a time, uh, which is no more, some of you may say amen, when Christmas entailed a tradition called in-gathering. I can tell those of you who are pastor's kids because you did not say amen. I might have even seen an involuntary twitch when I said in gathering. But man, I, uh, uh, the longer it is from my childhood and the longer it is since I said goodbye to my dad until Jesus comes again, the more I feel almost a sense of nostalgia about in gathering. <laughs> I leaned over to, uh, to Paul a little bit ago and uh, asked him, Paul, did you grow up with uh, memories about in-gathering? He shared a couple with me. I won't share them with you, but if you want to ask him about them later. Uh, some of us as pastor's kids, I can just remember just, uh, just, just one or two little insights for you, what it was like growing up in a pastor's family where we did in-gathering. I can remember my dad saying to me and my sister as we were literally in tears with frozen feet and, and frozen fingers, just one more street, kids, just one more street. And he could barely get the words out because he was hoarse from singing. Uh, uh, you know, back in the day, pastors were given a goal. They were assigned a goal. And uh, you met that goal. I can remember my dad actually writing a check once to just finish the goal so that we could be done with, with in-gathering. Um, but and from, from the earliest age, Rain, I was probably about your age, and my dad, uh, my dad would uh, would taught me a little a little uh, canvas that I would give. I'd I'd go up and knock on the door all by myself, and someone would come to the door, and there'd be carolers singing in the background. Usually, it was my dad and my sister and whoever else of the faithful they could muster. And uh, I would say, "I'm a little missionary trying to do my part. If you would give a dollar, God would bless your heart." And uh, so, man, $130 for a Jasper Award that was nothing, man. We got 130 in the first night, no problem, Paul. I just want to say. Uh, in gathering, do you, have, uh, do you have Christmas traditions? Let me take it a step further, and I want to ask you: Do you have uh, do you have Advent traditions in your family? Advent traditions in your uh, Christmas time memories? I'm guessing that some of us don't have as many Advent memories as we have Christmas memories. That's an interesting thing, especially if you grew up. Adventists. If you grew up Adventist, I want to ask you, what are your Advent memories? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question because um, as Adventists, we aren't necessarily as connected with the liturgical church world. And so we don't necessarily um, have the same kinds of traditions and memories around Advent uh, that we do around Christmas. And I want to suggest to us today collectively that maybe we're missing out in that case. I love the fact that Pleasant Valley uh, remembers Advent and that we come together during the weeks leading up to Christmas and, and remember together um, the messages of hope and joy and peace that come 
as a blessing of Advent. By the way, this is a little side note. It could qualify as a rant if I was not careful, um, but I just want to say the proper pronunciation of the word Advent is, of course, Advent. And we are, after all, Adventists. Just want to say, I just wanted to say that. Um, So if you've been tempted to put the accent on the wrong syllable, please stop it. It's like being from Oregon, if you know what I'm saying. (laughs) Don't do it anymore. We are Adventists. All right, so I wish you the blessing of Advent today, and uh, I want to challenge us to think about and enter into the spirit of Advent. I did, uh, because of my own unfamiliarity with the traditions of the liturgical church, I did some research into um, the meaning and the history of Advent, and I think there's a lot more that I can do, and I'm excited about that because what I learned reinforced my belief that we might be missing out by not remembering Advent in the ways that we could. And so I want to challenge you to think about um, the message of Advent during these next four weeks, the next 28 days as we're together leading up to uh, our celebration of Christmas as families and as a church. Advent focuses on expectation. Advent focuses on expectation. I loved the fact that the song that Hannah and and Pastor Randy just sang had a line in it that said, we have great expectations. That's a connection to the the meaning, the reality of of Advent. And the early Christians, uh, as as they were developing the, the celebration and the remembrance of Advent, looked forward with great expectation. In fact, Uh, There was a time of 40 days of preparation. Advent is a part of that. The first 28 of those 40 days are what we would consider part of Advent, leading up to uh, the celebration of Epiphany, which was the celebration of the time when the Magi came to worship Jesus and recognized Him as, as a Savior, also pointed to the time of Jesus' baptism. But there were 40 days of fasting and penance and prayer focusing on expectation. Did you know that? Expectation. Now, um, I think when, if you'd have asked me a few weeks ago to, to talk about Advent, I think I would have connected the idea of expectation because um, I've always thought of Advent simply as something that helps to prepare our hearts to receive the message of, of Christmas, the message of the incarnation, the message of Jesus coming and being born as a baby to become our Savior on Calvary. That is a part of the expectation of Advent. Yes, it is. But it's not all of the expectation of Advent. Did you, um, did you grow up uh, with an Advent calendar at home? Boys and girls, do you have an Advent calendar at home? Do you have something that, um, I, I remember very, very young, my mother would get us advent calendars and they were those kind, do any of you that are about my age remember those poster board things that had, they were all sealed up, but they had little windows that you could open and you had to tear the cardboard a little bit to open them. And we had, we used to get an advent calendar every year that was like that. And every year it was a picture, a scene, and every year you could open a little window and it was uh, it was just something, I said every year, I meant every day. Every day from December 1 until December 25, you could open a little window and there would be something behind it that would point you to Christmas. And that was something that we looked forward to with great expectation as kids. We couldn't wait to get our Advent calendar for that year and it wasn't enough to share. We each got one of our own and every day it was, a, it was just a, something that we looked forward to to open. All of those things I noticed as I think back on it, all of those things pointed to the message of Christmas. We have an Advent calendar in our home. It's one that uh, my sister, the girl's Auntie Chris, made for us. It's, uh, it's quilted. It's a labor of love. It's absolutely beautiful, uh, handmade, hand-stitched. And the scenes, it's got a, a, a little section for each day, and there, it's interactive in that um, on day one, you could put the star on the top of a Christmas tree, and it includes pictures of all of our family. Um, it includes uh, uh, 
little things like even uh, remembrance of our, our dog, Ollie, and some things like that that we can just remember about the things that are special to us and that have provided meaning. All of those things point to Christmas. But the reality of the history of Advent is that Advent was not about Christmas when it was initiated. When for, the, for the early Christians, the celebration of Advent didn't get linked with Christmas or the, the birth of Jesus until about the 6th century. And so for the, the, the early Christians, Advent was the very beginning of the liturgical year, the very beginning of the church year, and they spent four weeks in fasting and prayer and repentance focusing on the second Advent. The beginning of Advent is looking to not the first coming of Jesus, but the second coming of Jesus. And I, I thought about that and, and begin to wonder, what is it that we're missing out on as Adventists? See, we have things in our calendar that point us to the birth of Jesus, for instance. I mean, Christmas, we, we, we think about the birth of Jesus. At the time of Passover and, and the celebration of Easter, we remember the, the crucifixion and the resurrection. But what do we have built into our calendar every year to anchor us to the reality that we are Adventists? We have Advent. And we need, to, we need to engage with that reality. And so as we begin and as we look at the stories of Advent, I want to I challenge us together to connect with our identity as Seventh-day Adventists. We are Adventists. We are looking forward to the, to the real, physical, literal return of Jesus. And when we, when, I loved the fact that today, we, we, in our time of, of worship in song, we sang about um, songs that pointed us to the, the, the message of the manger, but we also sang about songs that, that helped us to visualize in our minds the King of Majesty, clothed in splendor and surrounded by rainbows and power and glory. That's the king that we look forward to at Advent just as much as the, as the baby born in, in a manger. And, and throughout the world now, for the next four weeks, Christians will be remembering and with hope and expectation the fact that Jesus is coming again. And then Two weeks, the first two weeks of Advent, focus on that second coming of Jesus. The second two weeks leading us up to Christmas, focusing on the, the first Advent of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus as a baby in a manger. I love, I love that, that connection. I want to take us to Luke chapter 1. I invite you to open your Bible as we look at this first message of Advent, talking about preparing our hearts. <clears throat> I said in... Um, my introduction uh, to the message that we, re we write up and share uh, on social media this week, that um, sometimes I need a little preparation for Christmas. You, you might relate to that. Like literally 20 minutes after the Thanksgiving meal was finished, one of my daughters said, Dad, can we listen to Christmas music now? Because I, I, I just rebel against anything related to Christmas before Thanksgiving. And so I was like, no, technically Thanksgiving is not done yet. And uh, we had a little argument then about whether the day began at sunset or at midnight, and uh, I'm not going to say who won, but um, I need some preparation, and, and the message of Luke chapter 1 is a message of preparation. Can we um, look together at the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah that begins in verse 5, Luke chapter 1, verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. You ever wonder why it matters? I mean, the division of Abijah, is that really significant? Is that important to us? Actually, you know what? It might be important to us. And I want to just uh, answer something that I, I get asked regularly. Some, some people will ask a question, um, was Jesus born on December 25? And uh, I hope you know the answer to that question is no, he wasn't. Uh, we don't believe that Jesus was born on December 25. And so, um, but the, the celebration, maybe there's a reason we don't know the day that Jesus was born. Maybe there's a reason for that. But there's enough, there's enough things built into the Scripture that you could know about the time that Jesus was born. And one of them is this verse right here. It says that Zechariah was serving in the division of Abijah. 
I'm not going to take the time to do the math and to dig deeply this morning, but I want to challenge you that um, if you spent some time and engaged with this question, you could see that because of the records of the Old Testament about the service of the priests, and because we know what month each one of those divisions served in the temple, you can know when, when Zechariah was serving in the temple. And if you know that, you can also know um, about the time of the beginning of the pregnancy. Uh, and most of those take about nine months. And it, Elizabeth was in the sixth month of her pregnancy when she was visited by Mary. And you can come to an understanding not of the day that Jesus was born, but about the time of year that Jesus was born. And I think that's very interesting, especially because I think that it's very likely that Jesus was born in early September. And there was a feast that happened in early September called the Feast of Tabernacles. Isn't it interesting that that feast is a feast that points ahead to the second coming? It's an Adventist kind of feast, if you know what I'm saying. That feast is the only feast that I'm aware of in the, 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 the calendar of feasts that has not met its ultimate fulfillment yet. It's a beautiful thing when you stop and think about it, and I challenge you to look at John chapter 1 and see in the, the message of the incarnation of Jesus that's referred to there, it says that the Word, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and you skip down to verse 12, and eventually it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. A lot of Bibles say dwelt. The Word there tabernacled among us, literally pitched his tent among us. Wouldn't it be amazing? <laughs> Wouldn't it be incredible if the image of, of, of God and, and the, 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 the image of a promise of a second return and, and a, of the Messiah and, a, and of the time that we live together in the earth made new? Wouldn't it be amazing if God chose that timing? to come and be born as a baby, to enter in and to, to, to tabernacle among us, that would be an amazing thing. It would be incredible. Uh, I don't know. I just think it's interesting that right here in the story of Zechariah, we see reference to him serving in the division of Abijah. Hopefully, that's enough of a teaser that you have been stimulated to think about going and studying and, and, and spending some time um, in prayer and Bible study about, about that question of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all of the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Sound familiar? There's, there are a number of stories in the Bible about people being barren, advanced in years, and having uh, a baby. And, and uh, I, love, I love this one. It's kind of told more from the perspective of the man, um, and which may be a little bit unusual when it comes to things about childbirth, but it says that he went into the temple and was serving there as a priest before the Lord, and he had a, an appearance appeared to him in verse 11. There appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And uh, as often happens in the scriptural record, when someone sees an angel, they're scared, they're troubled. It says that he was troubled, verse 12, and when he, when he saw him and fear fell upon him, but the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zachariah, for your prayer has been heard. And the angel goes on to tell him that, that they're going to have a baby. His wife, Elizabeth, is going to be uh, with child and and. The, the baby, he says that the baby's going to be named John and that they would have joy and gladness. And, and he talked about some of the things that, that they wanted their baby to do, not to, not to drink wine or strong drink and promised that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. By the way, parents, there's a call to prayer here. It's possible for a baby to be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, even from her mother's womb. I hope that we as a church family are praying for our little ones and asking that they would know as soon as possible, with great confidence, the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I, I, I want to challenge us as parents, as grandparents, as, as church family to be praying for the infilling of the Holy Spirit, not just in us as adults, but in kids it is possible for the Holy Spirit 
and, and it's, it's happened and it continues to happen. Children are used by the power of the Holy Spirit and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, even from their mother's womb. And it says, He will turn the hearts of many of the children of Israel so to the Lord their God, and He will go before Him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, how am I going to know this? I'm, a, I'm not going to read the rest of this part of the narrative, but I love it. Basically, the angel's like, I, I don't know. But I think when you read this, it's just like, how are you going to know? Well, first of all, you're going to know because my name is Gabriel and I stand in the presence of God. Second, secondly, the way you're going to know is that that question is going to be the last of the words that you speak until my word comes to pass. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Mic drop. And when, Eli- when, uh, when, when Zechariah comes out of the temple, and by the way, people were worried. People were worried. When, when you were chosen to go into the temple and to minister in the most holy place of God, it was a, t- it was a time of awesome reverence. Awesome reverence. And when I say awesome, I mean this puts the awe in awesome, if you know what I'm saying. We use the word awesome. Oh, that's great. No, the word awesome is to be filled with wonder and awe and even fear and reverence. And people started to get worried about Zechariah. What is going on? He's taken, it's been too long. He's been in there too long. Uh, and, and, And finally he comes out and he can't speak. And they realize that he's heard a, a word from God and that he's received a vision from the Lord. And it says uh, in verse 24, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. There was a work of preparation that John, this baby that was predicted, was come to do. I like that uh, there's a reference in here. It says in verse 16, he will turn the children of Israel to the Lord their God and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the people, for the Lord, a people prepared. By the way, um, those words would have been very familiar to Zechariah because those words are lifted directly from a prophecy in the book of Malachi that talks about one who would come to prepare the way of the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah was a very revered person Uh, a prophet in Israel. And you know why, if you've read the stories or if you were here um, during the series that we preached about um, the prophet Elijah, this man was a man of power. The miracles that Elijah performed and Elisha after him were were second only in history, uh, the recorded history to the miracles of Jesus himself, raising people from the dead. Incredible. Um, The spirit and power of Elijah By the way, the spirit of Elijah was what Elisha asked for a double measure of. And so even Elisha's power, his authority, was traced back to the authority of his mentor in that he asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. And Malachi talked about one who would come to prepare the way for the Lord. At Passover, every Sedar table, every every Jewish family sets an extra seat, an empty chair at the Passover table, and during the Passover, part of the Sidar is that they will go to the door and open the door. One of the children will go to the door and open the door and call out and look for the prophet Elijah. A great expectation because they understand that the prophet Elijah is the one who will herald the coming of Messiah. There's a work of preparation that John the Baptist is called to do. We skip ahead in the story. I want to point you to uh, the, near the end of this very long chapter, by the way, Luke chapter 1 is 80 verses long. And so let's turn down to verse 67. I'm skipping over a, a good part of the narrative because in the middle, you'll remember that the annunciation comes to 
a woman named Mary in a little town called Nazareth. Raji and I share in common that both of us have lived in that town at some point in our lives. And uh, the Church of the Annunciation is a place that we both walked by on a regular basis. That church that was built over a place where it's believed that the angel came to to Mary and told her that she too was going to have a baby. And then she ends up going and visiting Elizabeth. And you'll remember that um, as a part of even the fulfillment of the words of Gabriel, that this baby would be filled with the Holy Spirit even when it was in its mother's womb, the scripture records in this section that we're skipping over here that when Mary walked in the door, Elizabeth felt her baby leap, the Bible says, within within her womb. There was this Holy Spirit power and connection that was already, that was already there. We, we're, we're skipping over all of that um, for now and beginning in verse 67. Here's the thing. When you've, been, when you've been silent for nine months after you had an encounter with the angel Gabriel, you had some time to think about your first words. <laughs> what, what, is, what is John going to say when... He finds words again, and in verse 67, it says, And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Is John, that baby that was born, is that the horn of salvation? No, no. Zechariah understood that John's purpose was to prepare the way for the one who the Lord would raise up in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Those are the words of a man who's had nine months to ponder over a promise, a prophecy given to him by one who stands in the very presence of God. I think in those words, we find some significant ways in which we can enter into the blessing and the spirit of Advent. So, I want to share with you three ways that I think, these are three, I hope, practical practical and powerful ways that you and I can enter into the spirit of this first week of Advent and, and, and as the Advent season continues, that we can make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit, that He would do a work in our heart that would fill us with hope, that would allow us to be prepared for the second Advent and for the blessing of the first Advent. By the way, um, I loved when Ty Gibson was here, how he talked about how the Old Testament was a promise made and the New Testament was a promise kept, is a promise kept. Um, and, And I love the fact that we as we look at Advent, we become aware of the fact that we're living in the tension of a promise that has been kept, but not entirely, and, and, and we look forward with hope and expectation to the keeping of that promise in its final fulfillment. We, the promise was kept. Jesus came. Jesus came, and, and, he, and He came right on time, the Bible says, in the fullness of time, when the fullness of time had come. Jesus came and, and was in, made incarnate in, in this baby in a manger. 
That's a keeping of a promise, yes? But there's another keeping of that promise. And for these first two weeks of Advent, I want to challenge us as Adventists to set aside these next two weeks to focus on the second coming with hope, with hope. Because you know what I've discovered? When we hope, we find joy. I love it. I love it. The, the promise that is given was that a light shone in the darkness and that the darkness can't overcome it. When you feel like darkness is winning, the answer to that is hope. The answer of that is connecting with the reality that we are expectant that Jesus is going to come again and that it's not going to be long. And so we can join our voices with the voices of ancient Israel and and, and ancient Christians as well and sing together songs of hope and courage. One of them is, you know what, we should sing it right now. It's a minor key that ends. You know, sometimes when we think about minor, we think about sadness, but it resolves in the words rejoice. Can we sing a verse together? Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here. Until the Son. Until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You sing beautifully. You sing beautifully. These next two weeks, the first two weeks of Advent, will you let your voice Join with the voices of Christians all over the world as we anticipate the second advent of Jesus. We are Adventists. Let's be in that together. Let's, let's set aside these first two weeks of Advent and connect with the reality that we look forward to a real and literal and physical coming of a Savior that brings hope in the midst of darkness and that brings joy because of the hope that we have in Him. That's number one. Let's enter into that expectation together. Number two, I love in the middle of Zechariah's prophecy, it says in verse 24, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him, the Lord, without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him, all of our days. By the way, there's a connection between serving him without fear and what we see is the message of John the Baptist to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. When you're forgiven, you can live without fear. When you know that Jesus is coming again, we can live without fear. And and so we can focus right now in these first weeks of Advent on forgiveness and living without fear. Would that be a good thing for us to focus on right now? Do we need forgiveness in the world? Do we need more forgiveness in the world? Do we personally need forgiveness? Absolutely, yes. And when we uh, understand the forgiveness and reconciliation that we have because of the good news of the gospel, by the way, right here in the prophecy of Zechariah is the foundation of the gospel. we'll, We'll look at it again in just a second. But when we live in that connected reality... We have this sense of freedom, and we are able to live without fear. Number one, our relationship with God, the fear is gone, because perfect love casts out all fear. When we understand the love of God for us, it casts out fear, right? We, we don't come into His presence with fear, even, even though we know that we, um, on our own, we have nothing to offer, but we, we have the incredible sacrifice of Jesus, and that allows us to come into His presence without fear. Let's focus on forgiveness and living without fear. Number three, I want to challenge us to ask what we can do to enter into the spirit and power of Elijah, preparing our hearts to proclaim the knowledge of Jesus to people. That's that's really um, what, what, what was the 
the work of John the Baptist. It says, The child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for he will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to pre- prepare the way of the Lord, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. I love, I love that picture. We serve a God who is tender and merciful. He's a father. And, and, and I love that the gospel is right here encapsulated in this message from Zechariah about the ministry of John. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This year, church, this year, we've been focusing on a call from God, a call to live in the light that God has shown into our lives and to let that light shine through us to the world around us. And I see in the message of Zechariah and in the work of John the Baptist the, 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 the very same mission that we've been focusing on all year. And I'm, I want to challenge us together in these next weeks of Advent to re-up that we will finish the year where we began it with a commitment to let the light of God shine through us to a people that are sitting in great darkness. You know anyone like that? Has God put people in your life right within the circle of your influence already who are in great darkness to to give you the, the opportunity to be the one to help to shine the light, to help to prepare a way for the Lord. Listen, as I, as I thought about this message of Elijah and, and the fact that that prophecy from Malachi, that there would be one that would come in the spirit and power of Elijah, I was reminded that the early Adventists had an identity that was rooted in the Elijah message, that not only did God have a person that prophetically would, would come and prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus, but that he has persons a church, he's raised up a movement of people that would come and shine a light into the world of darkness. And now is that time. Now is that time. We have work to be engaged in. And the message of Advent is a, is a call back to us to re-engage with our mission as a church, not just here at Pleasant Valley, but as a worldwide church, that we have a message of hope and reconciliation and forgiveness and a message that Jesus is coming again to share. Can we be Adventists? Can we be intentionally Adventists during this season of Advent? I hope that you will study. I hope that you'll dig. I hope that something I've said has made you want to look further into this. And I hope that you will have a conversation. By the way, if you're like me, a little slow on the, you know, Christmas spirit, Advent's a great thing because you have an excuse to wait two more weeks to talk about the baby Jesus in the manger. For the first two weeks of Advent, I'm challenging us to let the light shine. And the light I'm talking about is the light of that ultimate keeping of the promise when Jesus comes back again. Let's be Adventists. Let's do Advent for Adventists. Let's stand up together and we're going to worship the Lord with a song that has been a blessing to us over these last few weeks. It's your breath in our lungs and we're going to pour out our praise. Let's do that together.